in New York State, if your house is known as haunted, you have to dis you have to disclose that when you sell the property to the next owner. However, if your house is on the site of a former chemical factory, you have no such requirement. No, nope, it's jurisprudence. You have to disclose that your house is haunted. Um, but you do not. <laughs> but you do not have to disclose if, you, if your house was built on a chemical factory. Not by the workers. The problem was when they started doing the soil testing, benzene was present everywhere. Those contaminants are the kind that they're so complicated and so intense that you don't even want to start exposing them because the problem is so crazy. And the moment you touch it and you move it, you're dealing with another piece entirely. So many of the many of the cleanup efforts are literally just to cap it as much as possible and then put in um, it's now law to put in uh, those vapor barriers. They they blow these vapors out of the building so there's no way these vapors can enter into the building. Especially in old cities like Boston, um, Chicago, um, Seattle, all those cities because if you were to look at like the history of New York, for example, you do like phase one investigation. So you go back to like the eighteen hundreds, wherever you can get maps, those fire maps, all these different industries, dentists back in the day would dump in their backyard. Uh, nail salons, if you name it, and that's a very common thing across really any city. Every plant has a specific affinity to certain So if you have a persistence of a certain plant that, you know, likes copper or zinc, then you might hypothesize that that's abundant in the soil. We can start there. As for looking at a site and understanding what is growing there and then figuring out what's happening in the soil, the microbes come into play there. Um, and I know that they're starting, DC is really curious to starting a research project where they explore the microbial diversity of the soil and then try and understand basis for the native versus the natives or different types of plants. It's kind of like your gut. It's up to the microbes mm -hmm. to decide whether or not you're going to take up the nutrients out of the food that you eat. Same thing here. It has all to do with that. So, to be safe, we're going to assume that you've got a significant amount of chlorine and chlorine in your water, and what you want to do is treat that water with humic acid. What you'll notice is that there will be a brown tinge to the water in your tank. That means you have more than adequately neutralized all that chlorine and all of that chloramine have been chemically neutralized. And so you're not going to be killing your organisms. And you've got food for microorganisms when you do that. You're going to be growing fungi. A lot of people like to take pantyhose and cut off the pantyhose and compost goes in there and you tie the top and you're going to hang it over the edge and you just make sure that that compost is in the movement of the water so we're ripping all of those organisms off pulling them out of the compost into the water so now the foods you add are going to grow those bacteria and fungi to higher and higher and higher numbers <laughs> So I also want to, uh, you know, we've got the compost. Now when we take some of the tea out, I want to put some of the tea so we can take this back to the microscope and take a look at what's actually in this compost tea. So I just want to fill up some of that. Yeah, it's like yeah. Is, that, uh, is there an issue using compost that has previously come from crops with pesticides or herbicides? Nope. Because during the composting process, yeah. as we get those organisms growing really, really fast, they're handling it. They are going to consume all of those pesticides. Uh, antibiotics, same problem. You know, they're going to deal with all of it, so I'm not too concerned. Right. Now, heavy metals, it's going to take more than 21 days for those microorganisms to get a heavy metal, uh, high level. concentration, back under control. Uh -huh. So when we're looking through our microscope, the shortest lens is 4x mag, the next one is a 20, and there's our 40. So we're going to be using that 40x objective to take a look at these organisms so you'll be able to see what you can see. We hopefully have all of the organisms in our soils to decompose the toxins.
to take the heavy metals and tie them up in the structure of the organic matter as humus. And it's a very long turnover time. We don't know exactly which species of bacteria and fungi are going to be doing those jobs for which plants under what conditions, temperature, moisture, oxygen concentration, all of these things that can change a little bit in the soil, and it's going to be a different species of bacteria or fungi doing the job. So how are we going to approach that? Our job is just to make sure that all of the diversity of all the bacteria and all the fungi, all the protozoa, all the nematodes, all the microarthropods are present in that soil. And then when the plant requires something, the exudate's going to come out. We're going to have the organic matter to keep all of those organisms that decompose whatever toxin we've got in that soil is going to be properly dealt with so it's not going to harm the plant. So those toxins are not going to get into the plant. Our job is just to put full, full diversity back in. And how do we do that? We make compost. We make compost under your conditions here with the starting materials that contain the organisms that are indigenous to your environment. They're already here or those plants wouldn't be growing. Every pesticide we put out there kills way more beneficial organisms than it kills target organisms. You're putting out that fungicide to kill disease-causing fungi, you're killing way more of the beneficial fungi that would work to suppress the growth of that pathogen if you would just let things be. Promote the growth of the good guys. There is no soil on this planet that lacks the nitrogen why are we putting out inorganic fertilizers? The nutrients are there. All we have to have is a biology. Oh, but what have we been doing to our soils for the last, uh, well, it's not just the last hundred years, is it? We've been killing the biology. Yeah. We've been uh, tilling, slicing and dicing and crushing these organisms. We've been putting on inorganic fertilizers, which are solids. And that kills your biology. Every time you put an inorganic fertilizer out, you are making certain that you are addicted to that inorganic fertilizer. Because once you kill the organisms, these nutrients cannot be made available to your plant. You're going to have to use the inorganic fertilizers. So we want to, if you're going to till, make sure you're tilling in some really good compost. So yeah, maybe you're breaking up the compaction that was here, but you're imposing compaction here. Make sure you are getting the organisms all the way down here. We want to lay a really good compost on top of that cow. So that um, when the root systems get to that really good uh, organic matter, they really see no reason to keep going deeper. Okay. They're going to get all the nutrition that they require, but the biology in that organic matter is starting to work on those lower layers. We're dealing with a compost tea. What we actually use a compost tea for is to apply to foliage. Because the organisms have to stick to the foliage. You have to have um, the bacteria making the glues. So the second, the instant they, that drop of water falls on that leaf surface, a massive number of those bacteria are instantaneously sticking themselves to that surface. They will not wash away. They will not um, leave with the drop of water as it starts to roll across your leaf and then falls off your leaf and lands on the soil. We want those organisms to stick into that surface so the bacteria make glues. That's why we have to feed them. We have to get them growing very rapidly so they're making those glue layers. You can tell me when to stop, okay? Thank you very much. It's good? Yes, because okay. yeah. my garden is very little. Yeah. Yeah. When we spoke on the phone, she was saying that her, all her stuff was growing so wonderfully after the last spray. Oh, that's great. And that all of the other people were like, how, how, is, how is it that your, that your garden is growing so much bigger than everybody else? I wouldn't step onto a single sink out the window. I'm sitting. I have a strange thought in my house. Campos uh, Senior Center, I don't know, South 30th, and that's what I'm doing. Sorry. Okay. Just realize uh, one of the most important things you can do when you have a uh, contaminated site is collecting fungi on site. Right. How many of you have ever picked wild mushrooms before? You know how to take a spore print? Okay, that's what that paper's for. When you do find a fungus or a mushroom, 
Uh, you can clone this with the tissue like we're doing here. I do it on a Patriot plate. But you can also take a score point because that's where all the genetics are, are in the scores. Right? You, get a, uh, you can get a, almost the same parent strain or a different ecotype. Ecotypes are what you need to understand that makes remediation uh, much better. And when you look at the interior where you chop the mushroom open, that's mycelium, compressed mycelium. So all you would really need is a tiny, tiny piece of that. Literally, like, not even that much. I'll do that so you can see it. That's generous in a lab. You need a tiny, tiny piece. And this one can start a whole other colony. You stick this on the plate, and then it radiates out. Now you have copied that fungus. You copied that exact ecotype. That would be important if you find one growing out of a contaminated site, wouldn't it? <laughs> And then I'll take a soil sample from the site and I'll mix it in with the water, all right? And then it'll go through that filter. The fungus will select the bacteria that it wants. Its team, remember it's recruiting those to take that. It really wants to clean that up to the finish line. All right, so uh, I take my ceiling, I float it on contaminated water, and I figure out where we can take this, just snip this, and plate it out and I can figure out what bacteria it is. You really want to know? All right? You can dilute that, you can isolate the bacteria, send it to the lab, and now you have a, an identity of the players. And I encourage that you would partner with a native plant expert, right? Um, and plant a community, a plant community, not a monoculture back in those sites. And we were down at the site, we are thinking uh, those aquatic plants, and we started thinking about mycorrhizae and mycorrhizing these back into the site. And if, you're, if there's plants on a contaminated site, digging some of those up, staining the roots, and looking at the mycorrhizae that are there, that are tolerating those conditions, but they're also remediating fungi. So you can harvest those roots, chop them up, and put them back into the nursery. In the soil, with the, your new plantings, they will pick up the mycelium by root fragment, and now you have inoculated plants with a fungus that was tolerating those site conditions. And you know, herbicides are quick. Herbicides are actually very fast. Hydrocarbons, a little bit longer. PCBs, a lot longer. <laughs> Get their stand. Uh, that they keep biotransforming into something else until it's carbon dioxide and water. That's your end goal. Okay? Carbon dioxide and water from something that complex. And we don't need mushrooms to fruit with remediation. All right? The only reason we may want them to fruit is for a heavy metal removal. And that's a morel mushroom. You know what morels are. They're really good to eat, but they're terrible for remediation uh, as far as tensile strength. They're really good at pulling lead. Really good at pulling lead. Is that what you want on your site? To make something surface that makes lead bioavailable? Imagine if there was a whole patch of morels here. You think the uh, locals would jump the fence and eat them? Metals is one of the most difficult things we're going to have to try to talk about. All right, um, some fungi are uh, capable of making it less bioavailable. All right, that's that's maybe the best we can do. Okay, there's a membrane approach where you can put a cap on that soil, have it pull out the metals, but then you have to remove the cap. All right, and maybe compost that. And what you're actually doing is, if we can remove a contaminant and not move it, that's our goal. A lot of companies just move it. You know, they have a, a, a license just to bury it somewhere. I think uh, being a little bit more creative, like the companies in New Zealand and China, you know, they're they're figuring out how to how to mine this stuff and reclaim it, right? Like gold and silver, and, you know, uh, reusing it back into circuitry. <coughs> Mushrooms are really good miners. They're excellent miners. So uh, I'm on a mission this year to end bins. And my big warehouse is filling those with different types of straw that are soaked in different household chemicals. And they're all going to get a fungal treatment. But the trick is when they get those bottles of stuff, I thought it would be a good remedy to have somebody empty those out dump them on to shredded cardboard where they can be absorbed, put in a big open top dumpster, slid into a warehouse for a few months, where it can compost. Better than throwing it into the landfill, and even better yet, better than incinerating. 